going to give you a sneak preview tonight of a film that we have uh, tentatively titled The Night Shift. Uh, it is a sequel to the documentary we did called Rape in the Fields, which is about the sexual assault and rape of female farm workers in America. That was, um, to our surprise, a, a, it wound up being quite a success, and also because it's a multi-platform collaboration involving the investigative reporting program here, the Center for Investigative Reporting, of which is represented on the panel, uh, Univision, and Frontline. Lots of moving parts in uh, radio, on the web, and um, English and Spanish versions of, of the film, and actually the first time in broadcasting that a new news uh, video production appeared on two national networks at the same time. Uh, not the same day, but the same week. And it was uh, successful, and it also it gave us the idea that there must be more to do, because as we got involved in it, when we were first talking to people at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the only federal agency that has jurisdiction over sexual harassment, uh, they mentioned, while we were talking about agricultural workers, that there's a real problem in the janitorial industry. And we didn't know exactly what they were talking about, other than they said that someone had been raped in the ferry building working at night. Um, and they had, there was a civil case about that. So when we finished the first film, we decided to go back and look at that situation and what were they talking about. Um, Originally, this story also is unique in that it was discovered, the idea of doing it came from a graduate student um, that, who had, had run across allegations about it uh, in a summer internship in North Carolina. And uh, it was produced, shot, um, and really conceived by graduates, alumni of the Graduate School of Journalism here, who are working at the IRP. Uh, this, this sequel uh, is scheduled for air on June 23rd, uh, and hopefully we'll make the date. <laughs> uh, so I want to I introduce, that is June 23rd on Frontline, and either the weekend before probably or the weekend after on Univision. We, we can't seem to knock some of their telenovelas off the air in order to put a documentary on. Um, so I want to introduce at the panel, um, we have Andres Sediel of, the, of our investigative reporting program, Daffodil, Daffodil Haltan, who's a video producer at the Center for Investigative Reporting, Bernice Young, what's well, Yearn, right? It's in Cantonese, a uh, reporter at the Center for Investigative Reporting, and Sasha Koka, who is the Central Valley Chief at KQED. I should remember, I, I forgot that KQED is the partner, the radio side of the partnership, and also a reporting partner. With that, let's take a look at a, the opening of the film. And the light. By the way, for various reasons, we're not going to mention tonight any of the companies that will be featured in the <laughs> broadcast um, uh, for some obvious reasons. And uh, but uh, I think. Uh, one of, the, one of the really interesting reporting questions uh, that's been raised by the previous film and in this film is how, do we get, how, did, how did we get the women to talk? And the person who really has done most of that work for us is Daffodil Holtan. And I wanted to just to talk a little bit about how do you get these people to go on camera? And what does it take? And what are the problems? Um. I think uh, a lot of us here know that access is all about negotiation. Um, I, in a lot of our work, we're always negotiating and negotiating and negotiating. I think the difference when you're dealing with uh, working class traumatized people is that, you know, if I'm talking to an FBI agent, if I'm talking to an attorney, they know what I want. and. Um, and we negotiate beginning up here. If I'm 
starting to knock on the door of or call a woman who has traumas that I can't even imagine or that I don't know about, I am not, uh, our negotiation starts way down here uh, because her life or his life is messy and complex and full of crisis after crisis, day after day. So I, as the reporter or producer, show up, and I am just another problem. And so the negotiation has to start, uh, it has to start with a conversation. It has to start with uh, very little being asked. And it actually has to start with me uh, asking what she might need or what he might need before we can get the conversation moving any further. Um, so the, the, the other thing I think that um, happens here is if you don't understand where people are coming from and you're showing up at their door or you're calling them and they're, this is, I think we have about nine women that went on camera for this piece that have gone on camera, maybe more, but no one that has gone on camera for this, everyone that I have sought out for this piece has gone on camera and shown their full face and decided to give their name. This has taken months. In some cases, it's taken eight months. Other times, it's taken two months. Other times, we meet, and I have to develop some kind of rapport immediately to try to let them know that it's going to be OK. The trick, though, is that I am not a daughter, and I'm not a friend, and I'm not an advocate. I'm a journalist. So the challenge, I think, for a lot of us in this situation is negotiating and setting that boundary uh, immediately, but also understanding that, uh, that, a, that, that a relationship has to emerge. If, if a lot of the interviews that we got for this film are very intimate, and that has to do with the months that I spent talking on the phone with some of these women and really not talking about their rapes or their sexual assaults, but talking about their daughter who was in the emergency room uh, because she has Down syndrome and she has to get to work and who's going to be there to take care of the daughter. The gangrene infection that another woman had and her mother is sick and her father is dying and I mean there's a lot of crises. And so uh, it, it, it really is a process of listening, of explaining what it is you're looking for often. It's not, it's not like when I talk to the attorneys and I explain, we're, we're frontline, we're Univision, we're doing this, and they understand, oh, okay, you're serious journalists, you're doing a serious project, let me see what I can do. It's, uh, it's really about, this is what we're doing, this is what we're talking about, and we understand that something happened to you, I understand that something happened to you, are you, will you talk about it? Will you talk about it with me? Will you go on camera? Will you go on national television? And that takes a long time. That takes a long time to make that decision. I personally wouldn't go on camera. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I'm, I'm amazed after months sometimes with, with certain women that they finally decided, I'm going to do it. And when that moment comes and when they're ready, we've gotten, we go quickly because you don't know if they're going to change their mind. Um, but again, it's this, it's, this, it's this ongoing negotiation that I think um, it's like this, this whole back end of work that you have to do uh, just to make someone feel comfortable. Um, and, and also, unfortunately, to, to make them, help them understand that I'm not going to be able to help in the same way that their attorney or their advocate or the, um, you know, the, the social justice organization that they've been working with is able to help them. I am not here to help in that way. I'm here asking them to make a decision um, about telling their story. And that's as far as I can take it. So some people say, well, how did you convince them? Or, or one woman said, oh, she convinced me. And I, I don't try to convince them, because if you, if you try to convince a traumatized person to tell their story when they're not ready, that is disastrous. And you have to think about their lives and what they are surviving, if, in fact, what they say they went through is true because that's something that some of the other team members are going to talk about. You know, we have had to report against um, all of these women who are making allegations of sexual assault and rape. So our job is multifold. Um, but in terms of 
of uh, getting to that point where they finally sit down and they tell their story. Uh, we also made the decision early on with Andres to do very contained, uh, as few people as possible. A lot of the shoots were just him and I because you also don't want a big parade when finally somebody opens their home and says, okay, I'm gonna tell you about probably the worst thing that, that's ever happened to me. Um, so we've tried to make the shoots as contained as an, and as intimate as possible because it's just, it's too much. Uh, usually after the interview, it's, 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 it's been a lot for everybody. Um, so that's, you know, it's, it's a different negotiation and I, I, I I also think it matters um, who you are coming to this. And I don't always tell everybody everything, but I don't hide the fact that I am a working class daughter of immigrants. My mother was a janitor. Sometimes that comes up, sometimes it doesn't. But I don't use it, I don't abuse it, but I also recognize that you, know, you can't, uh, people know. People know either you're from us and of us or you're not, and I'm gonna determine how much I let you in based on that. So um, that's also another real part of what this reporting takes. Bernice, how big a problem is this? Well, it's one of those things where when it comes to sexual assault or rape, anytime you're talking about that, um, any kind of number is kind of a statistical farce. You know, um, the U.S. government estimates that two-thirds of sexual assault and rape victims don't even report the crime. So I think that's something that, that we're also bringing forth in the piece is that this is a highly underreported problem. It's highly underreported to the police, and it's also highly underreported to employers. And I think part of the reason we've really focused on, you know, first with rape in the fields and then now with janitors um, is that we're, we're part of this kind of interesting larger national dialogue right now about sexual assault and rape in various institutions, um, the military, um, you know, uh, cam college campuses. And really there hasn't been that much looking at the workplace. And, and I, I think there's a very um, real reason for that and that's because it's very difficult to look at the workplace. We don't have federal databases. We don't have statistics looking at, you know, how many, um, reports of college rapes there are to uh, you know the Office of Civil Rights. So we're really trying to kind of um, look under the rug, so to speak, and see um, what we can find by ultimately having to pursue the only um, avenues that we can, which is looking at the public record through lawsuits um, and other statistics. So it's a really, really challenging um, area for looking at sexual assault and rape, but um, we, do ha we do have some numbers. Uh, the uh, Department of Justice, for example, says that 50 people a day are, are sexually assaulted and raped at work, so it's not you know, a complete rarity. And when you look at a uh, worker population like immigrant low-wage workers, there are just so many levels of um, just vulnerability there. There's language barriers, there's, um, there, in, in many instances, undocumented uh, legal status. Um, there's also, <clears throat> excuse me, there's also, uh, you know, uh, shame that, and, uh, you know, various other barriers. There's also kind of just a financial tenuousness that sometimes happens when you're in a low-wage work situation. So there's many, many, many opportunities to kind of exploit a vulnerable worker and then many, many barriers to reporting the problem. So I think that's really where we've really focused um, looking at uh, low-wage workers in particular. And I think also, you know, um, in, in looking at and being part of this kind of national conversation about reporting on sexual harassment, sexual assault and rape, um, of course, you know, we, we've been really guided by uh, the Columbia Journalism um, report that came out recently. We've really used that as a, as a tool to kind of bolster what we've been doing in terms of making sure that we cover all of our bases when we uh, look at you know, talking to perpetrators, alleged perpetrators, talking to various companies, talking to every point of view out there in order to make sure that we're really uh, bulletproofing our story. And we've really tried to do that by talking to as many different points of view as possible, even people who seem like potentially fringe um, individuals in a, in a lawsuit in order to make sure that, you know, what we're hearing is checking out um, at all levels. So, um, you know, I, I think it's been really interesting to do this work at this moment in time because there is this very, uh, you know, significant and robust conversation around uh, sexual assault and rape. Um, and I think we have an opportunity to kind of elevate uh, a part of, uh, you know, this issue that not very many people are looking at.
Andres, mm -hmm. perpetrator. Well, I mean, g going off on what Bernice is talking about, I mean, one of the things that we want to do, you know, obviously, a as is mentioned, we we're looking at cases where uh, hopefully there is a public record, hopefully there is sworn testimony, hopefully there's a police report, hopefully there's something that we can use to corroborate uh, what the victim is saying so that when she sits down and she gives us an interview and we can look at it and compare it to her deposition and say, well, is she consistent or not? Um, as a qu quick tangent before getting to the, to the perpetrators, one of the problems that comes up when you're doing reporting on sexual assault is an issue of consistency. Uh, there's a lot of science now, neurobiologists, and a lot of training going on in law enforcement because there's been a recognition that trauma victims do not, rec uh, do not remember series of events in the same way as a non-traumatized person does. Uh, when, that, when you're going through trauma, there's a part of your brain that takes over that inhibits the writing of memory in a straight line. So that when you've been traumatized, you remember things in different order. And we actually talked to one neurobiologist who said it would be almost impossible for a trauma victim to be able to tell the same story twice because it's not written in their brain that way. So if that's your source, if that's the person whose testimony uh, your interview that you're looking at and you're trying to corroborate it versus the deposition, they're sitting here giving you an interview and you're looking them in the eye and you say, well, gosh, I think I believe her. She sounds credible, but how can I prove this? I need to get all sides of the story. Um, and very often, if you go and talk to the perpetrator, if there's no physical evidence, if there's no witnesses, if there's no videotape, if there's no DNA, he's going to say, I didn't do it. Or he's going to say it was consensual. And then what do you do? Uh, you have a he said, see, she said situation, which is what hampers a lot of law enforcement investigations. In these cases, we're doing everything we can to, to get the perpetrators, the alleged perpetrators' uh, point of view. I mean, I think that was one of the big lessons that was pointed out from the, the Rolling Stone article from which the, the Columbia uh, report came out, was that the, the alleged perpetrator wasn't interviewed. In that case, also, the, the, the accusing party, she wasn't identified by name either. So in our case, everything what we're trying to do is to get people to go on the record, show their face, say their name, and do everything we can to get the alleged perpetrators to talk. That means uh, long road trips out to far-flung places and knocking on doors and um, you know, getting uh, chased off people's uh, doorstops and um, sitting out in the frigid cold trying to get people to talk and having people threaten you. I mean, all this has happened. Um, and yet, continue to go back to them. Um, there's a couple conversations I've been having with some of these guys uh, where, where I'm, the, I'm the one who wants them to talk so much because we, we really value their perspective because it's, it's one of the only things that we have to, to be able to put it against with the, the other testimony that's being shown so that we can make an informed decision. We're not going to be able to prove one way or another if there's not a criminal conviction. You know, if there were a criminal conviction, we can say, this guy was found guilty of rape. If there wasn't, if there wasn't even a criminal process, we c it's very hard for us to say that. So we're doing everything we can to get all sides of the, of, the, of the story. And I should add, we're not trying to prove whether or not these rapes happened. We are looking at a systematic breakdown uh, in the employment context of these alleged victims and alleged perpetrators. So it's also, we, we can't, we can't prove it, but we're just trying to make sure we, we, we give everyone an opportunity to share their story or defend themselves. Mm -hmm. And actually a lot of what this piece is trying to do uh, following up from the rape in the fields is to take it what happens next. So what happens once uh, Maria Bojorquez uh, reports her rape? What's the next thing that happens? How does the company respond? How is that investigated? What is law enforcement's response? And as we'll see a little bit later, what's the, the effect that it has on the family and all the other people involved in the person's life? So it's not just that the story begins and ends with the, the alleged assault itself, but all the ramifications afterwards. And the other thing that ac actually makes reporting on the workplace, uh, sexual assault in the workplace, particularly difficult is uh, confidentiality agreements that often result uh, when a complaint like that is made. And so when Daffodil was talking about negotiation, I mean, a lot of the early negotiation that happens is around what can be, you know, what can be said and what cannot be said. And often people think that, oh, I've signed a confidentiality agreement. There's no way that I can go on camera or talk to you on the record about uh, this particular case. But I think um, in being really um, just for, you know, clear about what we're pursuing and also being open negotiation, uh, we've been able to 
figure out way, workarounds, creative workarounds, so to speak, so that we can still um, you know, feature these individual stories despite a confidentiality agreement. Mm -hmm. You know, Sasha, you're, I think I always think of you as the voice of the Central Valley. <laughs> <laughs> but what's, uh, talk to us a little bit about the difficulties of reporting this for radio while you're watching all these TV people running around. <laughs> people. Yeah, Daffodil mentioned the parade of reporters. I mean, I think part of what we're doing here is really entering some uncharted territory with this multi-platform collaboration. I mean, we've got two hour-long television documentaries, one in English, one in Spanish, a uh, long-form radio piece for CIR's new program, Reveal, that's a mini documentary, three radio pieces for KQED, a Spanish-language podcast, a uh, piece for The Guardian US, various online components. I mean, the list goes on and on. We're really um, doing this in a very multi-platform way to get the story out there in all of these different media. But the process of reporting that uh, <laughs> can be complicated. And the choreography of how to do that when you're looking at an industry that's designed to keep workers invisible it gets very complicated. I mean, janitors are meant to work at night when those of us who occupy the buildings during the day are not there. They're sweeping up the crumbs from our sandwiches, they're taking out the trash, and we are not um, meant to see them. So then how to figure out how to follow them at night, say, while they're doing their job, um, is one thing if you're a print reporter, but what if you also are having a, you know, a radio reporter with a microphone and a television crew tagging along with you? So there's a lot of negotiation <laughs> that we've had to do as a team in terms of figuring out what we need. I mean, I'll always remember the first time we went out with a janitor at night to um, capture her cleaning. It became so apparent to me that what I needed for radio and what Bernice needed for print was so different from what these guys needed for TV. I wanted the janitor scrubbing the toilets and doing her job vacuuming while she was talking in the scene about what it's like to work alone at night, how vulnerable she felt. They needed B-roll. They wanted her to do the job as if the reporters weren't there. And Bernice and I figured out that we needed her to actually be in a scene talking with us for our media. So we sort of had to do this complicated choreography. And similarly, you know, we went in with a, a nonprofit that's um, looking at some of the working conditions for janitors in the subcontracted parts of the industry, the fly-by-night parts of the industry that go largely unregulated. And you know, we had to negotiate access with those folks so we wouldn't jeopardize their work. Former janitors going into buildings at night to talk to janitors who are currently working in the industry. Well, how do you do that when you've got this team of four people who are all attacking the story um, for different media? And you know, we, we figured it out. It, it got stressful and complicated at times, but you know, we ended up figuring out that if I could get the sound I needed um, and use wireless mics for part of it, we could use a camera that was less conspicuous and didn't need to have a microphone on it, and we could share the assets and go in together. But, it's a lot of you know figuring out this new multi-platform universe with a story that's very hard to tell and about an industry that's designed to be invisible. For me as a print reporter, I have to say it's been great to have everything recorded and then transcribed for you. <laughs> <laughs> now, Andres, we have another clip. Why don't you introduce it? Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll see another. We'll show another clip, and I think uh, this was. This clip was chosen because we'll, you'll see a little bit of the effect. You'll meet another woman. This woman uh, in Minneapolis had a similar situation happen. You'll get to see some of that, but also uh, shows some of the impact that you'll ha it has on the family as a whole. Okay. Well, I mean, one, one of the things I was going to say was uh, it's kind of draining to watch that. Um, we did that in the interview with the husband and with the wife in the same day, in the same apartment, in the little apartment with their son was there also. And so we basically spent, I don't know, the better part of seven hours sitting there reliving all this trauma. Um, and that's something that, if, if you can imagine that we've, we have nine such testimonies that we've recorded, uh, gets very draining. Uh, you start to hear these same stories over and over again. I think one of the things that's most shocking to me is how similar they all are, uh, both in terms of how uh, the actions actually took place, how the assaults took place, the threats, uh, the reactions from the women, the, the feelings of being trapped, not wanting to tell anybody, being scared to be deported. It's the same story over and over again. 
Um, and for some reason, we just kept on going back and getting more stories because it, was, it, it was felt like they, they had to be told. Um, but at the end of the day, and this is something for uh, you know, all the reporters out there, is what do you do with that after you've ingested all this material? It's one thing to you know, spit it back out into the edit room, um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's easy to go say, okay, let's go get a drink and forget about all this, um, which is which not always... Which we did, by the way. We, which we did. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the drink not being the important part, the important part being that we get together to then debrief about what just happened, uh, to be able to talk about what we heard, how we felt about it, the confusing things. Well, how, how is it possible that she, you know, was alleging four different rapes? Why did she go back? But how could, you know, but look at her husband and, you know, just all the, the confusing thoughts that go through your head um, and being able to let it out in some way. And I think one of the things that's been most valuable working on this project is having this team here where we could all share with each other what's going on uh, emotionally uh, because then you end up taking on this stuff and you have to process it somehow. Um, you know, maybe there's another panel we can do on the self-care for journalists. Uh, you know, I recommend therapy for everybody. It's great. You know, personally, I have a qigong practice. You know, just got to keep the qi moving. Just got to let it flow. Um, but, you know, there, there has to you know, go running, go swimming, whatever it is that you have to do. Um, but when you take on these stories, it's very heavy. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that we're also very cognizant about in terms of presenting it to you all, is that this isn't an easy topic to deal with. I mean, if you think about the fact, uh, all the numbers that, that Bernice is talking about, whatever it is, uh, one in whatever uh, women in this country have been sexually assaulted, uh, that's a significant part of your audience. That's a significant part of the people who are going to be watching this film, and this isn't easy stuff to deal with. So it's something that we take a lot of care with. We don't take it lightly, um, and we have to be able to process it ourselves. That's another thing I wanted to add just about the multi-platform nature of this collaboration. I mean, we as a team recognize that asking some of these people to recount um, what they say happened to them, these traumas, was very intense, and so we decided that we were all going to uh, approach it together in one interview, rather than having me as the radio reporter ask someone to recount uh, the story of their alleged assault, have the TV people, have the print people, but that, you know, it was less traumatic for everybody to <laughs> just do one mm -hmm. interview. Um, but, you know, there are, that's challenging as well, because there were times when all four of us <laughs> we're conducting an interview with somebody, and that can be really intense in a tiny little living room um, to have you know, a reporting team with multiple needs doing that, especially when you guys for television need to have a very quiet, beautifully lit um, two-camera interview that can be intimidating. I mean, I'm used to the intimacy of just bringing my tape recorder and being able to sit on a couch and kind of warm someone up and, and be able to ask them to get to the point where they're ready to share that kind of a story. So. I think we were sensitive not only to, to our own self-care and the trauma that we experienced hearing these stories, but also to, to making sure that they really only had to tell them once. Well, let me just say, uh, from my, my perch in this is, is at 20,000 feet, and working with them, listening to them come back from the field. One of the things that I was really curious about is what is the arc of this in terms of the janitorial industry? And one of the interesting things about it was that we discovered that there are a couple of very large companies that are in the janitorial industry, then with, let's say, 80,000 janitors. Then there are some mid-sized companies, but more than half of the janitorial workers in the United States work in companies with fewer than 20 employees, and therefore they are below the radar. They are under no federal regulations, basically, by the EEOC, for instance, looking at sexual harassment, very few people know who's running the companies, they come and they go, they're contractors and subcontractors, uh, and so for tracking who they are and where they are and who these people are, it's very, very difficult. No one, there's no general oversight. In fact, the unions involved, like the SEIU or the major corporations, have actually created these teams to go out and knock on doors, particularly in Southern California, to find out what is going on. These are the people who are not paying uh, withholding or Social Security or Workman's Comp, uh, working for various companies. And what we're going to do, probably for, uh, reveal for the first time in these in the national audience, is that there are organized crime groups, particularly out of Eastern Europe, who are, for example, importing women 
from the Ukraine into the United States to clean some of the major stores and malls in America. And they're keeping them in slavery, according to the FBI. And they themselves don't know how big a problem this is. They're just a few cases that give you a window into the fact that it is going on. So with that, um, well, I, I suppose time for questions, if anybody has any questions. Uh, we have one Mr. Rosenthal <laughs> in the back. We need a microphone, though. You don't need a microphone. <laughs> My boss. <laughs> uh, can you go a little more detail? Because I think as reporters here or editors, uh, one of the complications of collaboration is obviously working together and ego. But what I also heard here, and Andres, you addressed it in a really brilliant way, and Bernice addressed it from a print point of view, where Daffodil or Andres got video, or Sasha got some audio, but the transcripts really improved potentially a story that was text. And Andres mentioned, you know, the sort of the PTSD, the sharing of the trauma of doing this kind of reporting, which I think we all understand. But can you be a little more specific, or any of you talk about some of the, both the benefits of the collaboration and also some of the complications? Oh, you want to know about the fights <laughs> that we've had? <laughs> there are moments where we have to decide who gets what first. Mm -hmm. And we always want our stuff first, and they want their stuff first, and we have to prioritize and decide. Um, certain interviews, you know, I, I mean, it wasn't difficult often to decide who was going to do the interview depending on who had the relationship. So, um, you know, if, if there were certain interviews that Lowell has done, there are certain interviews that I have done. But it's, it's the prioritizing of, of you know, we had to learn as we went. There were interviews where um, Bernice wasn't getting what she needed. Uh, I was a print reporter. I've been a print reporter before I did television. And I, I knew that the lights and the camera and the action are not what you want as a print reporter. You want, uh, you want to be as inconspicuous as possible. And we were being as conspicuous as possible. And it was a, probably a headache for her. Um, and so there were, after a few times of trial and error where certain team members were more frustrated than others we had to decide <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take we're going to take turns or we're going to you know bef we realized we had to have a pre-production pre um you can't even call it a pre-shoot it's it's like a pre-material gathering session because everyone needed something different and so we decided uh after a few times of trying this when we were all together to, to get together before we went out to do the interview or to do the recording of the, the janitor and you know working at night, who was going to get what when and what did everybody need? Okay, I'm going to need this. I'm going to need that. I'm going to need to just be alone with her for a little while without you guys there. Okay, we're going to need you guys not talking and just let us shoot for a while without any interruption. So we had to decide beforehand what everybody needed and then and then actually went really well. Then we knew when to, okay, I've gotten what I need, you go, you go, you go. And so um, whenever the four of us were out doing that again, I mean, it, it was challenging when we went to knock on the perpetrator's door, for example. Mm -hmm. That was actually one where we deliberated a lot because we knew that it might be a one-shot deal. Um, and you guys maybe can talk about how that went a little bit, but it was, it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was challenging because we didn't know who, Mm -hmm. Who should get what? Who gets, you know, who gets the goods in this situation? If we might only have one shot. Mm -hmm. And sometimes <laughs> the situations are unpredictable, and it's hard. I you mean, know, we, it's we spent a lot of time mapping out plans, and they didn't always necessarily go. I mean, it's almost kind of one of those things when you're operating in your the medium that you're used to operating in. You don't even know how to articulate what you need until you're not getting it, and then all of a sudden it's frustrating because you're in there in the middle of, of reporting and you're not getting what you need and then it's, it's, you know, it's hard to kind of course correct. But I think what was really great about this team is that we always talked, you know. And so, as Daffodil explained, you know, we figured out, okay, how are we gonna make sure that everybody, to the, for the most part, gets what they need, knowing that everybody's also going to have to make a compromise. Um, and then also, I think one thing that we've sorted out eventually is, actually, we do need to talk about what everybody's role is here. 
Who's going to handle the lawyer? Who's going to handle this person? Who's going to be, you know, keeping the, the, the interview source, you know, chatting and comfortable? You know, I mean, we actually mapped that out beforehand. And I think when we, when we did that and had all that pre-planning, those were the most successful uh, reporting trips. I mean, I think it's, it's pretty clear that television is, is the big bully. Television has the, the most needs. It has the biggest footprint. Uh, we need to get in two hours early. We need to move your couch. You know, we have to set up lights here. Everybody has to be quiet, including the neighbor. I mean, it's when, for television to get what it needs, it needs everybody to get out of the way. And that doesn't work when you have friends and collaborators who also have needs. So that, that negotiation takes some time. I think the perpetrator, knocking on the perpetrator door is something more specific, Rosie, that I think is, is interesting for people to think about because I'm not sure we got it right. We have a guy, and this guy was a convicted rapist. Uh, he had been accused by uh, several other women. Uh, we knew where he lived. We, we found him. He was not at his registered sex offender's address. Um, and we're gonna go knock on his door. Well, if we get one shot, I want the cameras rolling. Well, is he more likely to talk if, uh, if, if a, a reporter uh, is up there talking to him and being nice and polite, maybe we'll convince him. What do we do? We only got one shot. Well, what if we are across the street filming him, so in case he says no, maybe we can get a picture of him at least and say that we tried. Well, if you're a radio rep reporter, that doesn't do you any good to have the picture if you're across the street. Well, can we record, put a wire, no, because we can't record him if he doesn't know because that's illegal. <laughs> so that conversation uh, went around in circles for a while uh, until we, we just had to go for it. Um, and we were um, moderate, moderately successful. <laughs> Pleasantly frustrated, but we did it. <laughs> Let's see, we have another question. You have a mic? Somebody have a mic? Yeah. Huh? <clears throat> you got the mic, you go. Um, given the excruciating difficulties of getting <laughs> women such as this to go on camera and tell their stories. Did you have to deal with the ethical problem of then telling the women who probably told their stories because of your assurance that they would be told publicly to tell them that you wouldn't use their stories, either because you had questions about their veracity or just they weren't as photogenic, they weren't as compelling, mm -hmm. they weren't as interesting as the people that you chose to actually put in the film? We actually didn't give them that assurance. We haven't given them that assurance. I mean, my goal, our goal has been to be as upfront as possible about our own process and, and how uh, tight our space is. So I actually, our, the conversation is, uh, this is going to be a longer conversation, but a very small amount uh, to none of it may be used in the film. Because, because that's the thing when I talked earlier about uh, being clear about who I am in their lives, is that I, I, I think sometimes some of the women were looking, there's always a, often a moment at the end of the interview where they start talking about just why they did it and other women can do this, things that you know will never make it in the film. Uh, and sometimes it's just useful, I, it seems to help for them to just be able to say that out loud. Um, and, but we try to be, I've tried to be as upfront as possible about the fact that we don't know what's gonna make it in the film because we're dealing with a lot of different complicated cases. And, and wanting them to make the decision not with the hope that their entire story is going to be broadcast, but with the, with the idea, you know, trying to be just as transparent as possible about what we're working with and how limited we are. And, um, and they've seen television. They, they, you know, you bring up examples, tiny sound bites, you know, it's, it's, we're talking about a lot of different stories. We're going across the country. So um, I think as it's getting now, we're getting into the edit and, we're, and people are wanting to know when is this gonna air and what's gonna happen. That's when the, these other conversations, it'll, it'll need to be about reminding uh, some of them, you know, this is, remember we talked about not knowing what was gonna happen, well this is, you know, it's, you're not in the film or et cetera. But I think, uh, I, I was trying to lay that out as, as clean, you know, as upfront as possible so that, so that people wouldn't get attached to um, this being their, their, their moment uh, 
to tell but, you know, but one of the story. sorry one of the benefits Rosie you asked about both the complications and the benefits of collaboration I mean one of the benefits is that there's more real estate well, with true. all of these different platforms yeah. and so in fact what's interesting is that we each got this material together and then we sort of went away into our little caves and, and didn't talk for a while and mulled over it and figured out how we were going to each approach the story and interestingly for each of our media, we've, we're, we're coming at it in a slightly different way. So there are stories that are gonna come out in the radio pieces that may not have made it into the film, and the print piece you know, probably has the most real estate. So I think that there are a lot of benefits, in fact, to the, to the fact that we got all this material and we can sort of figure out where it may have a home, and it may not be all in the film. And I think on the, uh, so the ethical question, actually, uh, I was thinking a lot uh, during this process about something that Sarah Stillman said last year at this at the symposium, which was that when she goes out to report and she's talking to you know um, victims, so to speak, she's always asking herself first, um, what is the probability that I will use this individual in the piece? And if there's a you know a decent probability or chance, then then you know she'll go for it. But if if she's pretty clear that it's not going to happen, it's it's probably also not worth you know, um, dredging up very difficult topics with, with an individual. So I, I thought a lot about that, um, and we, we talked about that as well. And I think, um, as Daffodil said, um, you know, through our various, um, you know, conversations with um, either the victim or their, um, their gatekeeper, so to speak, whether it was their lawyer or their um, friend, we tried to make clear um, that this was going to be part of a project, but there, there may be you know, 30 seconds of them in the film, there might be zero, they might be mentioned in the, in the, in the radio or print piece, or they may not, and just um, letting them know that, that you know, we appreciated the participation and it would all inform our reporting even if it you know, wasn't part of the final product. Hi, uh, Ricardo Sandoval from uh, NPR, and I'm kind of curious as to uh, what role, if anything, if any, uh, was played in, in this production, uh, the whole idea of, of U visas, okay, and uh, how many of the women um, were either under the protection of a U visa or were seeking U visas or potentially going to seek a U visa, and if you don't know what a U visa is, um, under immigration law, you can, uh, if you're a witness or a victim of a crime, and if you assist cops or prosecutors, uh, you can get one of these visas. The biggest problem is that they're, the, the, pr the process is oversubscribed. There are way more applications for U visas than are available. Um, so I'm kind of wondering if, if there was any role in this production played by the U visa and what you were able to do with that. Uh, we haven't gotten into the issue of the U visa in this film. We did mention it in the previous film, uh, though just quickly scanning through my mind the, the women who, who are in it, I think most of them have gotten U visas. I, I might, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but the, uh, and then there's the Ukrainians. Well, there's Ukrainians got T visas for being trafficked, um, but uh, so some people weren't undocumented. Some people weren't undocumented. I think the, w the way that it comes up, frankly, in, in what we deal with, especially when we're dealing with the response by, from the company, uh, they receive a, a complaint of sexual harassment and they find out that their worker is actually undocumented because they didn't know that they was undocumented, is that, oh, she must be trying to get a U visa. Um, so we've seen examples in which uh, the, the first thing the company does is to investigate the woman's immigration status. And then to say, hey, by the way, you're undocumented. Um, or then to use that as a, as a form of a, a defense and saying uh, that they, they're just after the visa. So that is something that comes into play uh, after the reporting. Now, one of the things I think is interesting to mention about the U visa um, is that for you to get a U visa, for instance, it's not as if you're undocumented and you've had a crime committed upon you and you get to get your visa. Uh, you have to go to the police. And you have to go to the police and say, this happened to me and I'm undocumented. So you've already, you have to expose yourself as an undocumented immigrant first. And then the police have to decide whether they believe you and whether you're cooperating with the investigation. And then they petition for a U visa. So it's actually quite a laborious process uh, fraught with risk. Um, so it, it doesn't seem to be 
uh, it's, it's hard to, to use that, in my opinion, um, as I, I, don't, I don't see that people would be coming out, outing themselves as sexual assault victims for that reason. But I mean, it could happen, I suppose. One more question? Dave. Uh, I'm Dave Marish from KSFR in Santa Fe. Um, when you said the company, uh, I'm wondering, um, do you mean the contractors who run the janitorial services, or do you mean the people who hire the contractors? Because I don't think it's at all coincidental that the workers in Rape in the Fields and the workers on the night shift are kind of morally outsourced. They're not geographically outsourced. They, they work in our community. But the real function of the contractor uh, is to dissolve any moral connection between the building owner or the developer or the large farmer who hires the contractor, who hires the victim. Um, and I'm wondering whether you tried to talk to any of the uh, owners of these large office buildings about whether, one, they'd ever met one of their night janitors, or if they had anything that they could call a personal human tie to any of these not-quite employees, because it's that not-quiteness, I think, that facilitates and sort of connects these two theaters of the same criminal activity? Um, we are planning to talk to some of the clients, as they're called in this world, um, you know, the big box retailers, the, you know, brand name restaurants. Um, so we would definitely will seek out um, comment from them. We haven't at this point directly, but um, I, your point is is um, you know an important one about the industry, which is that you know around about the 80s, all of the janitorial services started getting contracted out to um, you know middlemen essentially, and so the kind of the custodian of your where you knew you know, who was doing the work and they're were, they were part of your staff largely is not um, kind of how business is done anymore. And, um, you know, there are some critical voices out there. Um, you know, the unions, um, as you can imagine, take the point of view that, uh, that the building owners and the clients, so to speak, do it on purpose as a way to kind of evade liability um, is precisely in these types of claims wherever there are any kind of labor violations that it kind of inoculates them from, um, from these types of issues. In the trafficking situation that we uncovered, we have so many layers of subcontracting that, uh, you know, we're trying to understand, did the client, big, several big box stores, well known, you all know, you all probably shop there, uh, whether or not they knew that uh, their employees were being trafficked, uh, being sexually assaulted uh, by their employer. So there's so many layers of subcontracting that you can essentially say, there's no way I could have known. You know, I'm hiring X company, and X company is hiring this one, and this one, and this one, and here are the, here's the criminal organization that's trafficking in these workers. So. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. Sure. Uh, and thank you. Um, and, and we'll let you know if we make the air date. <laughs>